I've been asked today to speak to you about the skills revolution and the call for lifelong learning. And it's been very interesting for me to keep talking about the same topic for more than a year now because it is the same topic. You've heard about the future of jobs and the fourth industrial revolution. And basically what I wanted to do today when I accepted this opportunity to speak was to actually give at the end of the talk some practical things that we can apply as individuals. I wanted to pull down that very high level view of what technology disruption is and really be able to give you some tips on what we as individuals should be doing. Okay, so let's start with a little background first. So first off, what are the jobs that are most likely to be replaced by automation? So a little background. The term fourth industrial revolution was actually start it started to become popular about two years ago in the World Economic Forum. And that was in, done in Davos. And basically what they came up with was that most of the clerical jobs, like loan officers, receptionists, clerks, will basically be affected and that about 15% of the current job in both office administration and manufacturing will be gone. Okay? In between 2015 and 2020, a huge number of work will actually be gone. In the Philippines, according to the Roadmap 2022, about 49,000 people will be affected. And that's one of the reasons why we created human capital projects that would help transition these people into future skills. On the other hand, business, finance, management, computer mathematics, architecture, engineering, and sales will all grow. And that's just within the next six years. Okay? There's a direct quote, though, that I want to share. This is from as one of the top 100 CEOs, and he said, I have to lay off hundreds of people because their jobs have disappeared, and I don't need their skills. However, and who are the recruiters here? Show of hands. I have hundreds of job openings that I can't fill because I can't find the people with the right skills. It doesn't make sense, right? We're losing people, yet we have hundreds of thousands of open roles. Lives are derailed, families and communities are damaged, and business opportunities are lost. Next slide, please. So I mentioned this earlier, it's actually started. So the impact to the industry and the business models happened about six years ago and was started with rising geopolitical volatility, the mobile internet, cloud technology. I keep mentioning, you know, 10 years ago, there was no in, uh, Facebook or Twitter. But then you also see new energy supplies and technologies come in. You've heard about the Internet of Things, and that's basically our lives right now. 3D printing and how it affects manufacturing. And what we're looking at for the next four years is really advanced in robotics and autonom autonomous transport, as well as what we keep calling artificial intelligence, but actually, you're already experiencing it as augmented intelligence and machine learning, as well as advanced materials for biotechnology. So it's not just the ITBPO world from the perspective of clerks, admins, call center agents, but also how all of these new things coming out is affecting healthcare as well. Next slide, please. Raphael Rafe, the president of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, actually um, wrote an article which he called A Survival Guide for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and it is published online. What he said was simply this, every past technology wave ultimately produced more jobs than it destroyed. Okay? And you've heard that. I mean, from the HR Summit last year that IBPAP hosted, Ray and Lito kept mentioning about there are more opportunities coming than jobs being lost. We also said that all these technology insights will deliver more gains, producing higher living standards, increasing life expectancy, and 
the problem and the fear this time is that it's happening too fast. Okay. All past technology revolutions was a minimum of 10 years and a maximum of about 20 years. This fourth industrial revolution is happening four to six years. So it's happening about 75% faster than the other industrial revolutions. And if you note, you know, the figure, the box at the bottom, that image, length of careers now can last 60 to 70 years. My mom, who I always love to mention, is started out as a personal assistant in the same school that she's still working with. She will be celebrating her 50th anniversary, and although she is officially retired, they don't let her go. She's a consultant. And there's just that huge mindset in terms of expectation about how long we can stay in a career. So before, it's 30 to 40 years. Now, the Industrial Revolution is allowing us to stay 60 to 70 years. The average tenure of a job, if you graduated with a degree in accountancy or management, you expect to be in the same role for 15 years, maybe even retire in the same company. The average tenure is now just four and a half years. Okay? So anybody who's experiencing attrition for people between three to five years in human resources, that's a global trend. Why is it? The third image answers that. The half skill of a learned the half life of a learned skill is now just five years. What does that mean? Any skill that you learn today, it'll probably be gone in five years. You need to upskill. Because something else is gonna happen. You know? I was sharing earlier, right before I stepped here, I said, I don't have a laptop with me, but I'm gonna use my phone. I'm so amazed that I can now have PowerPoint on my phone. You know, and it's such a small thing we do every day, but it actually took away all desktops. It took away laptops. And as soon as, you know, things like the Google technology glasses and all of those things, I just need to wear an eyeglass and I can deliver this, right? So all of these things actually produce more opportunity. For most people around the world, the prospect of a future in which robots and computers can perform Many human jobs is a source of profound personal concern. But technology itself actually offers a solution. And in MIT, they actually created what's called MicroMasters, which is an industry-relevant skills and credentialing training unit. So you can actually take your test at any time, upskill yourself, take your training, your certifications at any time, 24 by 7, as long as you're a member of that. Okay, so it is existing. And anybody can actually allow their employees to devote significant time every week, every month, just upskilling. So when you befriend technology and allow yourself to use the opportunities, then you're not at the losing end. Because at the end of the day, what the top barriers are for the future work is strategy is simple. First off, there is really insufficient understanding of what the disruption will actually bring. The other is that there are resource constraints. Most companies are actually not technologically ready. And of course, there is that pressure in terms of profitability. But the future work strategy that responds to all of this, if you see that, you know, on the, I, I'm, I'm, I was looking at this, I was going, am I going to go right or left? Okay, my left is investing in reskilling current employees. Can you imagine that? About 65% is saying that the only answer to everybody's problem is reskilling. Now, I won't talk about what companies should do. Again, my commitment to you is something that you can take away at an individual standpoint. But it would be good to note that the talent to manage, shape, and lead the changes underway will be in short supply unless we take action today. We have to take action today. And my mindset is simple. You know, I've worked in multi-billion dollar companies. I've 
worked in Fortune 10 companies. And at the end of the day, as an individual, I can't wait for them to provide me with the skills that I need. I can't wait for them to provide me with the technology that I need. I need to do something so that when it happens, when those resources are available, I'm ready, right? Next slide, please. This you're probably sick of, but this is actually where we're going to be focusing on. In the World Economic Forum, they highlighted that there are 10 skills you need to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution. It's complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision making, service orientation, negotiation, cognitive flexibility. How many of those are actually technical skills? And how many of those are actually behavioral or soft skills? I would say that 10 out of 10, they are soft skills. Which means that the skills of the future rely on an individual having the right attitude and mindset to be successful. That's the great news. What skills were, will be changing or have changed over time? First off, creativity will become one of the top three skills workers will need to benefit most because of the avalanche of new technology and new requirements. With machines using masses of data, and they will start making automated decisions for us. Okay? What machines do is they gather all the data that's available, they analyze it and find a pattern. That's how they make decisions, right? And because of that, negotiation and flexibility will begin to drop from the top 10 by 2020. Because you don't need to negotiate anymore. The machine will create the facts, and you just have to share the facts to get your points across. That's really what machines are going to do. Active listening, everybody in the ITVPO world knows active listening is considered a core skill today, but it will disappear completely. Emotional intelligence, which doesn't feature at all, will actually become one of the top skills needed by all. There was a survey that was done by the World Economic Forum, and it was for the future of software and society. And what it shows was that people expect artificial intelligence machines to be part of a company's board of director. Artificial intelligence will be part of the board of directors of companies by 2026. Can you imagine that? Okay. You already know that there's an artificial intelligent robot that became the first citizen of Saudi Arabia, right? You're well aware, okay? So, how do we focus on what's needed for us? One of the first things that I really learned as a success factor for everyone is to have what's called the beginner's mind. I didn't coin this, I wish I did. And what the beginner's mind is simply this, and may I ask, who are parents here? Okay. Who are, of course, titas and titos of Manila? Everyone else? We, <laughs> such a relationship-based culture. We all love kids. But how many times have you played or watched a child play, let's say a Lego, and they're building stuff, and you know how Legos are now, right? There's a Lego city, and you're supposed to build a giraffe or whatever. And you start telling that child, that's not how you play. You're supposed to put the yellow block on top of the green block. And how many of you have done that? You're not supposed to do that. That does not belong there. You move that. How many times? But this author actually stopped himself and realized, who am I to tell a child how to be creative? And he was an engineer. And he's watching his child and he realized, what his child has is what's called a beginner's mind. Nobody told that child that A goes to B and B goes to C. And nobody told that child that A, B, C is an alphabet. So he would just say whatever it is, B is going to be a cat, whatever. It doesn't make him wrong. 
that child actually created something new that was not in existence before. So how do you allow yourself to have a beginner's mind so that you are open to these opportunities? Now, when Zoe opened up earlier and she said, are you ready for new knowledge? That in itself is already asking you to have a beginner's mind. One of the things that you have to do in order to have a beginner's mind is really, first off, be present. And I know we multitask, and I know that it's difficult to actually be present at the moment, but what that actually means is you being able to hear what's happening so you can react to what's happening instead of anticipating how to respond. The other thing is that you have to pay attention to your reactions. And this is not about you reacting at the present moment, but see a pattern. When you start to really focus on it, you'll discover that your mind is always a thoughting machine. It keeps thinking about what it's already done or what's going to happen. It tries to anticipate, and that's really a flight or a fight or flight response. It's you protecting yourself from making a mistake. However, the problem is, and this is for those of you who have experience again in recruiting, past behavior predicts future behavior in similar situations, right? But what if this current moment is not exactly similar to the past? And because you're not in that moment, you're actually missing how to react. Now, you have to recognize whether you have a tendency to be resistant, to be irritated, to be dismissive when you hear a suggestion that is totally different from what you currently have. That's an ingrained reaction. That's a learned skill. Again, all of the skills that we currently have, you have that because it was a source of protection for you. That was how you learned. You knew from past experience that if this happens, B happens, right? But this is the age of technology disruption. You don't know what's going to happen next because we've never been in this time. Never. There's just no way you can predict how the person in front of you will be reacting. And then... Lastly, you start to practice being supremely, supremely open. Now that you're aware of your initial reactions, are you too quick to either be dismissive and shut ideas down, or are you close-minded? That's not going to work. Okay. Six years ago when I joined Hewlett Packard Enterprise, I came with 12 years of recruiting experience from the call center, okay? And the first thing one of the country heads told me in my first two weeks was, your ideas are not gonna work. There's just no way because you're from the call center, you don't know how to recruit for an IT company, which is a typical mindset, right? These are people who've been in the IT industry for 10 to 15 years, and their views are well-founded. Volume recruitment will not work for niche skill hiring. The only thing I told them was this, allow me to fail. That was all I said. Allow me to fail because at the back of my mind, I'm also asking for the opportunity to succeed. Right? Just give me that. Within four years, by trying out multiple volume recruiting events in niche skill hiring, which ultimately created better customer experience, the Philippine Global Delivery, Center in, Global Delivery Center in Manila became one of the top recruiting hubs globally for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. One of the most successful that I love to share was when the country head for security asked me to hire 70 ethical hackers who are certified within three months. And I laughed. Like, <laughs> you're kidding, right? And he goes, no. And I said, okay, so where do I source? And he goes, oh, we actually have all of them. Like, 
any recruiter would probably go, okay. And he goes, no, seriously. Hewlett Packard has the most ethical hacking certified technicians in the Philippines and anywhere else in Manila, you'll find, you'll probably find one ethical hacker. That's it. In every company that is close to us. So I go, so what's your non-negotiable? And he goes, they have to be certified ethical hackers. And I said, but you're looking for people who have eight years experience. And he goes, well, ethical hacking in the Philippines costs about 150000 to get certified. So you have to have at least five years experience before you can afford the certification. Makes sense, right? So he goes, so, you know, you really will find people who have eight years experience. Then you're going to find people who are ethical hackers. I said, no. What's your non-negotiable? And he goes, ethical hacking certificate. Okay, leave that alone. So I did a quick Google search about ethical hacking in the Philippines, and I found out one of our tier one universities recently graduated people who already have ad ethical hacking certifications. E inside tip, you talk to me later, which tier one university that is. But what happened was, I went back to him and I said, I know you're not going to hire fresh graduates. I know. So what will make you comfortable with this pool of people that I'm ready to send you? And what they did was they created an assessment and we did a two-day hackathon. We invited the top 40 students of this particular school. They came to us for two days. They did a technical assessment that was created specifically for them. And then they were hired. 35 of the 40 people, 50% of my target was hired in two days with the experience being waived totally by the hiring manager. The simple premise is that both of you have to be willing to have a beginner's mind. If I was close-minded about the need for technical assessment, and if I didn't come to the table without, with facts, we wouldn't have been able to hire such niche skill roles in two days. Now, the better news for the Philippines, because I'm very passionate about putting the Philippines on the map, this particular hackathon model was used in several Hewlett Packard organizations across Europe, and it became a model. So come to the table being ready to listen and hear what their non-negotiables are. Work with that. And then come back to the table with a new experience that is backed by facts. Okay, next slide, please. I wanted to share what PricewaterhouseCooper did. They actually had a challenge where the pace of change that they were going through was too quick for them to upscale people. And what they did was they assessed 250,000 employees on what they were calling as digital fitness. What is digital fitness? It basically means how ready is an employee to transition to a world of continuous change and continuous learning. And as a result of that assessment, each of their employees were given bit-sized information about their insight to consume information that complements and expand their skill sets. So their skills were identified, and then they were given information about themselves on how they can improve themselves. Two key elements were asked. Is that employee a collaborator? Do they know how to use social capabilities to solve professional problems? So if your strength outside of work is speaking to people, how well do you bring that to the table. Next, what's the employee's level of curiosity? That's never been asked. Isn't it amazing? How curious are you? Why is that important? It's important because you have to want to learn about the business. You have to want to learn about your niche skill for that business in order to contribute to that business. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're talking about now is your individual impact. We're not waiting for the company again to provide all the resources for us. The question that we're asking now is, how can I contribute while 
this VUCA world is happening all around me. And it's simply these two things. How willing are you to learn? And do you really want to know what you're supposed to learn? Those are the only things that you need at this point in time because everything else is still being created around you. Next slide. This is actually my last slide. And I wanted to leave you with the words from one of the professors of Oxford. And what's interesting is he's the professor of globalization and development. Imagine that. There's a topic and a degree. Now just focus on globalization and development. And what he said is very simple. Learn to learn. Do you still know how to learn? Are you open to learning? And not by learning through rote memory, but having the curiosity and learning ability to be open to new ideas. Focus on areas that machines are not very competent at. Machines will always be better at us with data analysis. They just would be, but they can never learn empathy. Not yet. Okay? There are facial recognition softwares now, but it will only recognize the emotion of the speaker, but it can't empathize, it can't relate. And what each of you have that a machine can never have is that instantaneous reaction to human emotion. Okay? Keep that in mind. Then he says, Adop adoption of technology does not have to be a trade-off. What does that mean? If I'm going to get something new from the technology, I'm going to have to lose something. It doesn't have to be. Use it to create new opportunities for you. Learn what the machine is for and adapt yourself to that machine so that you become a better worker because of that machine. And then lastly, he said, achieve a T-shape in an individual knowledge structure. So what's a T-shape? Have a wide range of knowledge and a deep understanding of each of the topic. Now that's, again, a new way of thinking. For the last five to eight years, we have been focused on becoming specialists. And now, we're being asked, to be masters of a lot of topics, but that's the only way to cope, okay? And what's interesting is, while this globalization is happening, I can speak for a fact that so many Fortune 20 companies keep looking at the Philippines to create global hubs. They are actually migrating work from different countries and moving them here. Why? Because the Philippines is still considered to be one of the top 10 countries with the happiest workers. I don't know what that makes us. <laughs> but we also have the highest, one of the highest levels of work integrity. So our country is currently well suited for this techno technological disruption. 20 years ago, when the call center industry was at its infancy, within five years, it became the sunshine industry of the Philippines. Because the workers were sincerely sympathetic, they learned empathy, and above all things, they mastered multiple systems in less than five years. There is no reason that that can't happen again with artificial intelligence and data science. So I would like to end my talk with congratulating everyone of you who are here today because as human resources professional, you have actually created this opportunity for our country within the last 10 years. And I believe we're all ready for this to happen again. So thank you very much.